Day Metal Dave with you here on another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Jason McMaster. And uh, today we are going to pay tribute to one of the biggest rock stars that you never saw on stage. And I'm, like talking, I'm talking about a guy who's probably done more for rock and roll and heavy metal, and you may have never seen his face I'm talking about legendary record producer Martin Birch, who uh, sadly passed away a couple months ago, uh, but not before he left us um, a treasure trove of essential hard rock and heavy metal albums. I'm sure you've got some in, some of them in, in your collection if you're watching this podcast or listening to this podcast. Uh, we are going to go over his legacy and talk about what an important figure he was in the in hard rock and heavy metal. We'll get to all that in just a bit. But uh, Jason, how you doing, man? What's on your radar this week? I'm doing good. Uh, I have been busy. Um, feel welcome to laugh. I have been busy writing country songs. <laughs> I don't really have much of an opinion about about the irony is. I don't have much of an opinion about about country songs because I feel like what the industry calls country now is not country at all, and that's that's about sums it up. Yeah, you're right. Um, but I think that you know if uh, if you were ever on hee haw, you're real country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Hee haw was a '70s TV show that was really based about uh, country music. And very hillbilly uh, humor, hillbilly humor. Yes. And um, it was kind of like Saturday Night Live for, you know, Hicks. <laughs> uh, and me and my dad watched it religiously, you know, in the in the late 60s, you know, yeah. when I was four or five, six, seven, you know, up into the early 70s. Yeah. I remember and catching it, a few episodes. He, yeah, and uh, I mean, but between uh, Buck Owens and Roy Clark, who were on the cast, that's who it was. They yeah. got the talent. I mean, those guys could write a song and play a guitar, and everything else like nobody. Like, like uh, they were the Ingve Malmsteins of you know, they were the Eddie Van Halens of that style of just you know, chicken picking, giddy up kind of stuff. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and they could write any kind of a uh, emotional, you know, any kind of song that you know that that fell under that umbrella with uh, all the all emotions. So and what are you writing you for? Tear in my beer kind of stuff, and as well as just super fun party time kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, so are you putting out a country record? Is that what you're saying? Well, maybe one day. I mean, I write Christmas songs too, but those are yes. even harder to write. Those are harder to write because I'm trying to write a good Christmas song. I'm not trying to, you know, write, you know, fuck Christmas, heavy metal Christmas, rah, rah. you know, I'm not trying to do anything like that. I'm trying to write a fucking Christmas song. I'm not trying, I'm not writing a heavy metal song and putting Christmas lyrics on it. You right. know, um, so, you know, I'm, uh, I guess I'm a songwriter. I've been doing yeah. it my whole life kind of thing. Of course. Uh, I've so what are some of the challenges? In the, and it just feels weird saying that, you know, I'm a songwriter, you know. It's, <laughs> no, I write songs. I'm not a songwriter, but I write songs. Uh, so what are some of the challenges for you in uh, switching gears to write country songs versus what we know you for, hard rock and heavy metal type stuff? Is there any unique challenges that, uh, that you kind of struggle with? It, it doesn't come as naturally to you or does it all come as naturally to you? Well, you know, when I write, you know, metal stuff, like it's uh, the tone of lyric uh, and the tone of just the the guitars, like the literal tone <laughs> of the music is the complete opposite. Um, the of course, it's that's why they call heavy metal heavy metal, and that's why they call you know twang twang in country. You know, that's why it has that. Yeah. Uh, my comment earlier, like what Nashville's calling country now is just Bon Jovi with a cowboy hat. It's yeah. not country. It's <laughs> not 
there's not there's no twang in it. They're exactly. just calling it country because somebody's wearing boots. Right. So uh, <laughs> it's just a pop song, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's got too much cologne on it. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, so the what gears do I have to turn off? Is kind of your question. I you know I just uh, I have to write lyrically and tone wise of, you know, the, the musicality of the whole thing has to fit. Um, you know, it's like writing a blues song, you know, a yeah. woman left you, you're in a terrible relationship. You know, I'm going to have another beer or I'm going to turn on the TV and lose my mind and forget about fishy. things. And, you know, it's a, it's whatever it is. I mean, rock and roll has the same. It all is coming from that same, that same place, but you know, writing a song for Igniter is going to be about um, conquering other worlds and you know, <laughs> uh, bearing shields and and swords and fighting off the enemies and uh, going faster and faster down a, a you know the black hole to discover you know some kind of a new god you know it, it's that's metal it's fan fantastical right yeah yeah and i think country is ob- just about dirt it's about <laughs> real it's about things you can hold in your hand it's sure. about barefoot you know yeah. it's a little more uh it's not it's not comic book stuff right? yeah yeah not that all not that all heavy hard rock is comic book stuff but there is that to that element to it so that's a good question when you kind of have to have a perspective of what it is that you're writing. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I am writing for, uh, this kid in Los Angeles who is from Oklahoma. So it's not completely, uh, you know, why are you writing for a, a kid in Los Angeles? You know? Yeah. Um, he's going to have about four or five of my songs on his record, uh, which is really awesome. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit of a collaboration, but I'm kind of juicy right now, so he's just gonna do versions of what I'm sending him, right? Nice. Um, nice. Yeah, he's in the middle of a record right now, but so this is for something he's gonna record after his current thing. His name's Tyler Heath. Um, and how did he find you? He knows well, about he you. From... In, he, he's he's kind of mini me. He he sings in a cock rock band called uh, Leather Duchess. Oh right, yes you've told me about them before yeah and i think you would love their record which is they're about doing another one i think they're actually he's he's tyler's busy right now he's writing you know he's doing he's he's mini me dude he's writing for about five different things right now (laughs) so uh anyway um cool it's been fun what about you um funny that you're talking about country western and and music with a twang because uh uh, I spent the past week listening to the latest album from The Hangman, and um, uh, I just love that band. And for people who don't know The Hangman, uh, they came out of L.A. in the late 80s. I think um, I saw them way back then at just somewhere in Hollywood. Yeah, they're a real... Uh, they're nothing like the L.A. scene that exploded yeah. around them. They're not hair metal. They're not cock rock. Uh, they kind of came out of that same scene, but they're much more gritty. They've kind of got some twang to their music, a little bit of a southern vibe. They kind of remind me in some ways of, of, of Junkyard in that they were courted and eventually signed to a major label and then the label wasn't sure what to do with them because they didn't <laughs> fit in with the poisons and the warrants and the rats and the quiet riots and Sounds stuff. Sounds familiar. Yeah, 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 yeah. So their latest album is called Cactusville. It's actually been out for going on two and a half years now. And uh, I'm a huge fan of theirs. They've been uh, a band for, they've been on and off for about 30 years. Uh, you could argue that more off than on, and they've done the whole gamut, you know, uh, they imploded, they had, you know, drug issues, they had label issues, they had crappy management, a lot of bad decisions, blah, blah, blah. And then every couple of years they'd bounce back with something and then they'd go away and then they'd come back with a new lineup and then they'd go away. So 
through it all, it's a very tumultuous existence. But the uh, the lead guy is a guy named Brian Small. He's been the constant throughout the uh, the career of the band, and uh, they've done some really great records. And that first album uh, came out in '89 on Capitol Records. And yeah, that's uh, the that's that's the version of the band that I was familiar with. Yeah, was that, Jimmy from Junkyard in that lineup? Yeah, I that's was just I going there. So so Jimmy James, who is currently in Junkyard, uh, is in the current version of the Hangman and has been in various versions in the past as well. Uh, so y- you could you could say he's you know pretty pretty well glued into the lineup. Uh, of the hangman and the bass player this woman named angelique congleton has been uh in the band for quite some time too so people you know when i'm trying to describe them to people i always call them i always describe them as sort of a junked out tom petty uh because they kind of got that americana yeah yeah, they kind of got that rootsy americana vibe but they're much seedier you know they're they're like the the bad dudes in the dark corner of the pool hall that you don't want to meet in the alley afterwards, that's, that's you know? Perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So they kind of you... remind me of Tom Petty or Izzy Stradlin, or uh, they're, they've they been heavily influenced by that Los Angeles uh, cow punk band uh, X, uh, maybe some Tex and the horse heads in there, uh, but real twangy, real cool, real down and dirty. And uh, the latest album is called Cactusville. My mine's on green vinyl, and I don't know how limited that is, uh, but it's the version I've got. And this album might even be more twangy than uh, than some of their previous ones. Um, it's an interesting album. It's a great addition to their catalog. It's on Acetate Records, and uh, Acetate is owned by a guy named Rick Ballard, and he's always had a pretty good roster of down and dirty bands that don't follow trends. He's got the Hangman, Super Suckers, Junkyard. Uh, I think he had Throw Rag at one time. So, yeah, anyway, I'm getting Fine my uh, my Hangman fix this week, uh, listening to the new album Cactusville. Yeah. Worth picking up and checking out. Cool. Uh, we got a lot to talk about in our feature segment today, so let's get to it. <laughs> And today we are paying tribute to the legendary record producer, Martin Birch. Uh, Wow. What can you say about Martin? I mean, the guy has had a career that's almost unparalleled as far as a producer in the hard rock and heavy metal genre. Uh, You could argue that metal and hard rock wouldn't be what it is without the influence of his and on the albums that we're about to talk about. Uh, he got his start in the, I believe in the late sixties, early seventies, going back to like the early versions of Fleetwood Mac and, uh, and, uh, wishbone ash. Uh, but he's primarily known for, uh, in my opinion, his streak of records that he did with iron maiden, um, and there's many others that we're going to talk about, but uh, if Martin did nothing else except the Iron Maiden albums that he did, which is about nine or ten albums, by the way, uh, that right there would make him a legend. He did every Maiden album from Killers through uh, Fear of the Dark. So obviously that captures the uh, the classic legendary era of Iron Maiden and Martin Birch is responsible for all those records. They actually wanted him to do the first album, but he was already booked. So they yeah. had to wait and they picked him up in time for killers. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll talk about those Maiden albums in a bit. And, uh, I know that, uh, Martin was, uh, behind the scenes on a lot of the albums that you're, that you enjoy as well. So you want to you want to pick it up and talk a little bit about Martin's influence on some of the albums that uh, sure hold near and dear. When when I think about Martin Birch, I feel like I'm late in the game only because when the records that uh, sort of shaped the records that warped my young mind, um, I'm sure I was reading over his name many many times when right. I was on the floor with my records spread out everywhere, having me a, a record, a vinyl listening session. But, you know, yeah, uh, you know, 
um, his name has been around since the mid to late seventies and have been in everyone's, uh, been on everyone's turntable their entire lives and they don't know it, which again, I'm going to raise the chalice and say, this is the reason why we're talking about him. Yeah. Um, I think that me not realizing, uh, that he had done my favorite Iron Maiden records, um, or, uh, you know, heaven and hell and mob rules by black Sabbath. Yes. And, Classics. and had worked with Dio and, and deep purple and rainbow and stuff prior to those records. Right. Um, uh, I, I didn't see the Dio solo, the Holy Diver. I didn't see those on his roster though. Are those on those, Martin records? No, I don't believe so. Okay. I think he did the the rainbow stuff, and then okay. that was pretty right. much the extent. Yeah, of it. and and then and then followed Dio into Sabbath. Right. So, um, right. Heaven and Hell. Um, when I think of Heaven and Hell, um, and Mob Rules, because they're they're consecutive and they they sound like they were recorded in one session, and yeah. with Martin at the helm, that's the consistency is always going to be uh, pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, there's this thing that I noticed on uh, probably Number of the Beast and um, um, Heaven and Hell where there's this thing that Martin would do. And when you think about measures in a song, it's usually counted by fours or eights. The one, if you can find the one um, in within a measure of a song, you know, if you got a riff and it's going one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, okay, and so on and so on. The kick drum, the bass drum, yeah, on that one will be louder than the other kick drums within that measure. Soak it up for a second think about that so when when you're listening to iron maiden and you and you and you notice that because you're a super nerd and you're completely deep listening and worshiping what's coming through your speakers and you're noticing this kind of a thing yeah and, whoa that's really weird that it's like you know up there's like this punch of the kick drum at the top of the measure and there's usually a crash symbol with that you know boom you know there's plenty of kick drums within that measure of eight you know the kick drum just doesn't go one and then wait for the measure of song to go through until the drummer hits the kick again. Right. Realize that's not what I'm saying. Right. Right. There's a kick drum pattern that follows immediately after the one that fin finishes right. the measure. And, but when that next one would come around, that kick drum is slightly louder. I'm noticing this, yeah. whether I'm wearing headphones or not. I noticed this iron maiden record, not going to go song, song to song just iron Meg go 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 to uh heaven and hell no, same thing yeah completely audible that the kick drum on the one is louder than the rest of the measure he's the only producer i've ever noticed not even knowing realizing it was martin birch as to wow i wonder why this iron maiden song has the kick drum louder on the one Wow, I noticed the same thing on songs blah blah blah, you know, X and Y on Heaven and Hell record. Yeah. And I'm holding two records and going, oh, it's Martin Birch. There's That's the a link Birch thing. There's yeah, the link. yeah. Right. So yeah. The reason when you this might get a little like nerdy here, but what else is <laughs> That's, That's what, what we're we here do. for. What we do, right. <laughs> yeah. We think about that. Why would he do that? Well, that actually gives the listener something to lock onto if the song is fast or busy or just when you want to have that, you know, one, two, and a three, and a four, and a one, and a two, and a three. You think about this, you know, oi, or this yeah. audience going rah on the one, and then they're waiting to do it again, rah, you know. He yeah. was building arena rock. He was helping the band sell <laughs> their song to the listener by having this like surge like a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. Mic drop. You know, you, 
You know, yeah. that's a big deal to to um, to be become part of the band. You right. know, to to help the band sell the song. I mean, the band's not going to come in and go, "Hey, man, you need to turn this kick drum down. It's louder than all of the other ones," and have to have him explain to you why he might be doing that. Yeah. I'm sure Iron Maiden knew right away why he was doing that. Well, Maiden, uh, you know, it makes perfect sense that they went looking for him because they were all, you know, Steve Harris uh, was a huge Deep Purple fan, and and uh, Martin's career with Deep Purple is is incredible. I mean, he was involved in the In Rock uh, album, Fireball, Machine Head, Stormbringer, Burn. I mean, okay. all those classic titles. I, I believe he was an engineer on those records rather than a producer, but... Uh, but Steve Harris, of course, was a huge fan of Deep Purple, and he's like, "I want my band to sound like that. Who may who's responsible for that sound?" Who's and, setting uh, up the microphones? That's who's getting the sounds. Who's yeah, setting up the microphones and might be twiddling a couple of knobs up there to get it to sound right. But the that's but, the engineer. A lot of people don't realize that's yeah. And and Steve recognized whatever it was that was responsible for that sound, and you know he went looking for Martin Birch. Uh, like I said earlier, he wanted uh, Martin to do the first Iron Maiden album, but Martin was booked, so they had to wait until he was available and he did the Killers record, and then they had a lengthy career together, uh, which which is incredible when you think about those albums. I mean, Martin Birch produced Killers, Number of the Beast. Uh, peace of mind, somewhere in time, power slave, seventh son of a seventh son. I mean, dude, <laughs> that's just well, you incredible. Had me, you had me at incredible. killers. You had what? me at killers. You had me at killers. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. if, if if all he ever did was killers, that'd be great. But yeah, so he he's responsible for all of the classic Maiden albums, and I think it says a lot about him and his ability to work with the band. You know, because. As you know, the producer is – there's got to be some chemistry there among the personalities. It's it's pretty hard to have a working relationship that lasts that long if there's a lot of friction. But at the same time, you can't have somebody who's just rolling – you know, rolls over and doesn't offer any input. So there was a very delicate balance that obviously worked well for years and years and produced, I mean, classic, classic records – you know, number of the beast, peace of mind, come on, killers. And then, um, you well, know, once, you mentioned- he was, once he was done with those records and, and Iron Maiden would leave, you know, to go on tour and, and work the record, he would jump right into the studio with with Purple or Sabbath or Lou Oyster Cult. And, right. Uh, Michael Shanker group or. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's res- he's responsible for two out of three of my favorite albums, those being The Number of the Beast and Black Sabbath's Heaven and Hell, which we've talked about already extensively here. But the fact that the man, it's kind of like you said, you're listening to Iron Maiden and you're hearing that kick drum and you're listening to Black Sabbath and you hear the kick drum and you put the two together and you go, oh, wow, there's the, there's the, there's the common denominator. It's Martin Birch. Well, I was already... Uh, I'm one of those nerds that reads the liner notes. So, and I got into Iron Maiden and I knew the name Martin Birch, but I didn't realize I wasn't aware of his reach. And then when I discovered the heaven and hell album, I fell in love with the album first before really, you know, reading the fine print and re- and realizing Martin Birch was responsible for that as well. And then you go into mob rules and so two out of my three favorite all-time records are I have Martin Birch to thank for and uh, and a whole long list of others. I'm a big Maiden fan, so all those Maiden albums I just rattled off are, are, are mainstays in my collection. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you could I, argue that— I mentioned that, earlier he, was, he might as well be in the band. Right, exactly. He, he yeah. like created he he created part of the sound that you heard, which uh, it, it charges you emotionally. He might as well be in the band. He's helping mold uh, what those songs are sound. doing. He's, yeah, he, yeah, they're writing the tunes and all the chords and the and the maps for those songs, but he's like. He actually is doing, I mean, like the kick drum thing. It's not the only thing that he's doing. He has a way that he 
creates tones for those those records. It doesn't matter what band is in the studio that he's working with. Right. All of those things are relative to a sound that he has, which is the reason those bands hired him to make those records. Yeah, he's got a he signature might, sound. He might as well be in the band. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a thing. So well, you know, I mentioned uh, that Steve Harris was uh, influenced uh, big time by Deep Purple, but he was also a huge Rainbow fan. And Martin Birch is all over those Rainbow albums with Ronnie James Dio on vocals. Um, so you know, Rainbow Rising, it's considered one of the greatest metal albums of all time, and that's Martin Birch. Um, and then Long Live Rock and Roll and uh, Richie ba uh, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow with the song Man on a Silver Man on the Silver Mountain is on there. So all those Rainbow songs that you know with Ronnie James Dio singing, that's Martin Birch producing. Of course. And uh, when here's some trivia for you. Um, I I just became aware of this uh, recently and I found it fascinating. Do you know who the artist is that did, you know the uh, the iconic album cover Rainbow Rising with the fist grabbing the the rainbow of course right Do you know who who is responsible for that painting mm. I I'm, I'm I have to say no I could guess but it, um, is it an all in the family thing here is there something going on here that no, no, oh, but you, Dave, what's it? What's no, it but you'll know, you'll recognize this. Uh, it's Ken Kelly who also did Kiss Destroyer and Kiss Love Gun. Oh, wow! Yeah, okay. okay. How about that? I've I've yeah. recognized that Rainbow Rising image since I was a teenager. I always thought it was an awesome album cover, but I had no idea who who was responsible for the painting in in the yeah. artwork. Now that you say that, my brain is tying that that style of painting together. That, that yeah, art style. yeah, yeah. I mean, I always thought the Kiss uh, Destroyer and Love Gun covers were awesome, of course. Uh, and there you go. There's another awesome uh, album cover that I had no idea, and they're connected by Ken Kelly, the artist. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, you could argue that uh, you know, Deep Purple, uh, Rainbow, the Iron Maiden catalog is is amazing. I mentioned uh, on this show not too long ago, a previous episode, um, I was digging into the uh, that Blue Oyster Cult, Fire of Unknown Origin. That's Martin Birch. I mean, the guy's uh, the guy's resume is just outstanding, and uh, those albums that we're naming are essential hard rock and heavy metal albums. So you could you could arguably say that he helped shape the way that he helped shape the sound of metal as we know it. That's correct. Uh, I, because uh, I mean, I you think of metal's this. defining bands, you think of Iron Maiden, you think of uh, Deep Purple, yeah, you Purple think of Rainbow. Rainbow. Black Sabbath, yeah. yeah. So, Black Sabbath, yeah. So I was gonna, I was gonna say, and this is kind of a funny thing, um, is like if you're, you know, if you if you're in a if you're if you're on the road and you see those truck stop CDs or cassettes, even sometimes maybe not cassettes much anymore. I'm aging myself. That's fine. Uh, like I care about that. Um, you know, if it's like you know trucker metal or you know truck stop rock or whatever, one of those things you pick up. Yeah. Sometimes those are like hidden gems, man. They have a rack in the back and there's, you pick up a CD and it's, you know, it says, you know, uh, road metal or road kill or something. You turn it over and it's got all these bands we're talking about. It's yeah. like Martin Birch is all over all of the songs on all of those bands on, all, <laughs> on every song on just something random compilation record. Right, because you can't really put together a comp a heavy metal compilation without touching on four or five of the bands that he was producing. You know, the, ca the case is rested. We yeah, rest the case. yeah, that's, that's a serious thing. So the uh, you know I, I actually held the the vinyl of the of the uh, the the movie Heavy Metal, uh, yeah. the soundtrack the other day uh, on vinyl. Uh, which is a recent spin of mine, um, mainly to hear the uh, the Blue Esther Cult song that's on there. Yeah, Veteran of the Psychic Wars. Yeah, yeah, which you did confirm that is uh, from Fire of Unknown Origin, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah. Produced so by Martin that, Birch. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Martin. 
um, <laughs> and I, I don't want to, you know, take, you know, take a break to read what else is, is on the record right now. We all, a lot of us are familiar with the songs on there, but I wouldn't be surprised if he engineered or brought coffee to somebody else on one of those other tracks. I don't think anybody's, uh, I don't think Martin's delivering coffee to oh, anyone. Oh, it's the oh, other oh, way sorry. around. Dude, <laughs> Black, Sa Black Sabbath Mob Rules is on the same soundtrack. That's, yes, you are, you're right, you're right. Recorded there you go. Apart. They're recorded either the same year or a year apart. Yeah. yeah we've there actually you go. It's like if you try to put together the ultimate heavy metal mixtape, it's going to be, half of it's going to be produced by Martin Burge. You can't avoid it. You, you know, this can't. is this is a a very interesting stub our toe moment. These are aha moments here that uh, I, I I'm just going to pat ourselves on the back here and say I don't know if anyone's really been putting this together in their nerd mind uh, <laughs> to talk about this. The fact that uh, two different bands who are not necessarily related to each other by any means other than, oh, same producer, a year apart, uh, you know, uh, Ron, you know, Dio's American, but Black Sabbath is, you know, British, from Birmingham. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then Blue Oyster Cult is from, check this out, the same area that Dio is actually from. New York, somewhere. Jer Jersey, I think. I thought they were New Yorkers. Whatever, sure. same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New York, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I might, I might get my ass beat for saying that in some parts. Yeah, of the right. Country, yeah, but, you got to be careful who you say that to. But you know, that Upper East Coast is uh, is where Do and uh, Boc are from. Yeah, and that's another. That's another story. But um, I think that that's really cool. I want to jump in and. Uh, express how big of a uh, a Michael Schenker fan I am. Um, I am a UFO fan. Uh, they were supporting Rush, my first concert, which we've talked about on the show too. But yeah, my favorite Michael Schenker record is kind of an odd bird because it came out a little later than his earlier things with you know the you know Armed and Ready and and um, uh, you know, the early solo career of Michael Schenker. The the uh, record I speak of is produced by Martin Birch, uh, yeah. Assault Attack. Yep. Assault yeah. Attack. Um, yeah. Uh, I, the songwriting is incredible. The melodies that Graham Bonnet, who worked with Martin Birch in Rainbow, when he was in Rainbow, uh, just uh, just after Dio's de depart, you know, Dio left Rainbow to do Holy Diver. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they everybody knew each other in that camp. And Assault Attack comes out. Uh, I want to say eighty five, eighty four, maybe. And uh, that's after the BOC and after uh, even probably Mob Rules or it could have been, the, yeah, Mob Rules even. And uh, of, of course, of beast. Of, of, yes, of course, after Rainbow stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think at that point uh, in uh, Rainbow would have been, um, oh, another singer. I can't think of his name right now. Joe Lynn Turner. Thank you. That's him. Uh, so this assault attack record. Yeah. I guarantee the, the kick drum on the one kind of thing. <laughs> guarantee it's on there. Yeah. Uh, uh, completely has Martin Birch's signature thing all over it. Um, when I imagine hearing the songs like right now, I hear tones that are on Mob Rules, a, a Number of the Beast, even killers. I hear tones. I hear drum tones. I hear, uh, I even hear like peace of mind stuff that are yeah. completely relative to this record, which David, it very well could be why I love the record so much. Yeah. I'm telling you, there's an element in the tone of the record. It's the songwriting too. The guitar playing is, do I need to say anything else? You know, yeah. Yeah. it's, it's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. Um, yeah. The, uh, 
the band that Michael had on that record is uh, is is sick. Um, but I just want to say that uh, you know my favorite record by Michael Schenker Group. I don't think that it's so random that Martin Birch, you know, helped them create that record. Is all yeah. I'm really trying to say. Other than yeah. just nerd for a second and like just kind of give that record a big hug right now because it's it's completely sick. I use a lot of the song the the some riffs from the title track for that record in my lessons at school that just for a little uh, just for some trivial stuff there. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Yeah. You know, but you know, number of the beast ain't going anywhere. Heaven and hell is not going anywhere. Peace of mind not going anywhere. All day Mob long. Rules. Yeah, yeah. All the all of the Blackmore and Deep Purple fans, you know, obviously know who Martin Birch is. If they don't, they're dead. I need to I I need to go back after after this episode and see. Uh, I'm I'm not sure that Martin did any of the rainbow stuff with Graham Bonnet, but I could be wrong. Um, I, I know obviously he did the D yeah. stuff, but I don't know if he wrong. did the Graham I, Bonnet stuff or anything beyond that. But I mean, he did the Dio stuff and, and, you know, that's ironclad cemented, you know, yeah, but here's, guys, here's they another, knew, they all knew each other, you know, oh, there's, yeah, a, yeah. there's a, a gene pool, uh, that Martin is a, is a, a member of, uh, that includes so many, um, well, it's like Ancestry.com. We were talking about this, yeah. and uh, which I'll just I'll just talk about the elephant in the room. For those people listening, you're going to remember Martin Birch because we are going to mention him many more times on this show because yeah. of uh, other show ideas and uh, the mark that he has made on uh, hard rock and heavy metal. It's you're going to yeah. hear the name again, and we might be on what might seem like a different subject. So well, yeah, and and I wanted to throw in another band that that we should uh, we should make note of. Uh, Martin did spent a lot of time with White Snake, um, up to and including their their North American breakthrough, the Slide It In album. So uh, I know I played that record a lot at my house when it came out, and uh, I know for a lot of people in America. That was their first introduction to White Snake, even though the band had been around forever. But uh, yeah, since 1978, uh, yeah, which is when the, he was doing Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac. 78, Mark, 78. 78. He, was, he was doing Peter Green before 78. 78 oh, was. was already. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, 70, he, in 78, he did Long Live Rock and Roll. That's yeah, with Dio. Uh, he in 77, he did On Stage. Uh, this is Rainbow. In yeah, yeah. Five was Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. So it's it's Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, uh, Rising on, and then something called On Stage. That's a live record. Yeah. Uh, Long Live Rock and Roll '78, and then they did something again and Final Vinyl. But that was a compilation. So his but, first White Snake record was in '78. Yeah. So so he's. Back to uh, yeah, seventy eight to eighty four. He had a pretty good run with White Snake, and the point I was trying to make is that uh, you know overseas White Snake was doing pretty big business, but they really were totally unknown until the Slide It In album here in America, and that was when they first got some airplay. And uh, you could say, I mean, the next album exploded, but they got their foot in the door in America with the Slide It In album. And once again, that's Martin Birch. And uh, he was working with Cozy Powell on that uh, that record on drums. It's interesting that you point out the uh, the kick drum and your recognition of that. All these bands that we're talking about had really exceptional drummers. Oh, yeah. And so, the, you know, the the... the the raw talent of the drummer combined with Martin's ear for what you were describing uh, on the kick drum there, there's uh, there's some commonality there too. You know, he, he definitely worked with some great drummers and, and maybe that's, maybe that was uh, one of the things that helped him make the decision as to whether or not he was going to work with a band. Do you have a great drummer? <laughs> you confirm, know, confirm that he did, he did burn, correct? Yes. Okay. Well that's Coverdale. So they had a relationship. 
Yeah. From purple yeah, yeah. into white snake, which right. is not a shock at all. I, right. I'm just, it's like I'm just you putting said. it out there. Just yeah. like you said, if you if you could uh, put together a family tree with Martin Birch being the trunk, I mean the limbs would just go on forever, and they would get and they would be tangled. And, yeah, know, yeah. Because... So this is definitely a, a lot of the things that were were. He's coming from a certain family that we are going to talk about in other episodes. Oh yeah. 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 But uh what what are some other records by him that uh that are worthy mentions that might be older or even newer? What was the last record he ever that he produced, do you know? Well, I know the last yeah, and well, okay, I know that he stopped working with Iron Maiden after the Fear Fear of the Dark album. I think so, he retired that year. He didn't, yeah, he didn't just so, retire from Iron Maiden. <laughs> yeah, I I he wasn't retired. clear on whether he retired from the industry or if he retired from Iron Maiden, but I do know that Fear of the Dark served as sort of a stopping point. At the very least, it's the stopping point of his work with Iron Maiden. It may have been when he dropped out altogether. Um, but, you know, I'm a huge Iron Maiden fan, and especially that era from the first album until... I admit that I kind of, after Somewhere in Time, I kind of got a little less interested. But out of all those albums, the only one he didn't touch was the very first one. Every other Iron Maiden album I love is produced by Martin Burge. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm a huge fan of the Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, and Mob Rules records, and those are his too. So you're right. We're going to reference him many, many, many times because just like we were saying, if you've made a mixtape of great heavy metal songs— Martin's probably going to be the producer on half of them, and you and I aren't going to be able to have a discussion without referencing Iron Maiden or Black Sabbath or Blue Oyster Cult or Deep Purple, and on and on and on it goes. You know? Do you know? Uh, do you know much about Wishbone Ash? What do you know about Wishbone Ash? The only the the main thing I know about Wishbone Ash is they were the band that wrote the song "Better Better by You Better Than Me." The that Judas Priest gotten some legal trouble for over uh wasn't that the one where the kids killed themselves out on the playground or one kid lived yeah they they uh it was i think there was some shotguns involved or yeah weapons involved and uh they were there was a uh i'm sure they were on drugs too and yeah made a bad decision and and blamed it on judas priest just so they'd have a fall guy and uh, it turns out it was a cover song. The band didn't even write. And they swear that they heard, like, do it, do it, or something like that in the yeah. song. Am which, I correct? Uh, Is that, am, I, am I correct in thinking that Wishbone Ash, I can't, I'm, now I'm wondering I if it was Spooky I don't, Tooth. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember it being Wishbone Ash. But, Maybe it was uh, Spooky Tooth. We're going to get it. Maybe, yeah, it's Spooky Tooth. You know what it is? Spooky Tooth. I actually have the record. Oh, really? Spooky Tooth. Yeah, so it is Spooky Tooth. That's okay. Yeah. That's all right. Let's go back to um, Martin Birch didn't produce Spooky Tooth. So um, Martin Birch wouldn't have put any backwards messages on many records. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, especially on a Spooky Tooth record. Uh, <laughs> the, the interesting thing that always pops up when I hear people talk about Wishbone Ash is the influence they had on Judas Priest, ironically. Yes, okay. Because they're the band, they have, they're, they're, the early, they're the band with the dueling lead guitars before people recognize dueling lead guitars right. as a thing. That's yeah, right. yeah. Because, uh, you know, when you think Deep Purple, there there's a lot of dueling um, guitar and keyboard. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, there's a lot of that stuff going on, you know, like super fast licks going on but harmonized with a keyboard yeah and that's part of the purple sound um yeah. and i think a lot of bands took that and started to do that kind of a thing with loud fast rock music right which became a thing but i want to say that uh you know, Wishbone Ash was one of the bands of Judas Priest was like, we, I want that, you know, I want to, I want our sound to be this almost stereo thing, even yep. in rehearsal, 
And the way that we do that is have these these two guitars playing playing the same phrases but with different notes creating this harmony going around and there was not a whole lot of people doing that in hard rock yeah uh, which all points so, forward again to iron maiden right and right exactly yeah. as well as martin birch because yep. he's he's producing multiple wishbone ash records yeah uh, if, if he's the engineer on most of those but right. once again the engineer is the guy that's uh you know putting two and two together and making it come through the speakers yeah um, creating tones and probably influencing the way that he hears the songs yeah by what he's doing with microphones so well you know i was thinking uh knowing that we were going to do this show and we were going to pay tribute to uh to martin birch i i got to thinking is there another producer who's been as prolific as Martin Birch? And when I think about it, the only producers I can think of who who even come close, and I don't even know that they equal Martin Birch, but the ones that come close to having um, huge sales and being highly influential in their own right would be Rick Rubin and Brendan O'Brien. But unlike Martin Birch, those guys, their palette is kind of all over the place. Like Rick Rubin has done Slayer and Danzig, but he also did the Black Crows and Tom Petty and Johnny Cash. And He's Brendan O'Brien, Brendan O'Brien the, you know, did Bruce Springsteen and Pearl Jam and stuff like that. So there's ACDC. And ACDC, there you go. So, you know, think about the the difference in all of those bands, whereas Martin is kind of, he's firmly cemented in the hard rock, heavy metal, at least for the most part. I'm not saying there wasn't a one-off album here or there or whatever, but in terms of producers who've been highly prolific and successful in the hard rock, heavy metal genre, I don't think Martin, Martin Birch has anyone even close to him in the in that race no the in the the in the uh, sort of bowl of uh of projects that he's done consistently with the way the way the the years add up um you know just when you like just when you just look him up you know i'm if i just look him up it's like a it's a shopping list. Uh, it's it's like a haul you would make on a regular day at the record store and get home. And I'm sure this has happened to many, many people um, during a certain era, of course, where every record you brought home that day is produced by the same guy. And it's Martin Birch. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's pretty hilarious. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's it shouldn't be a surprise uh, to people uh, that read the liner notes that that's going to be a common denominator with all of that. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it's, it's interesting. I don't know, um, if Martin Birch did any work with Judas Priest. Um, not that I'm aware, but Roger Glover produced sin after sin for Judas Priest. And Roger Glover was the bass player for, Rainbow. Deep rainbow. Rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. Deep Purple, right? Deep Purple. Uh, yes, he spent time in both bands. And Jimmy Bain was in Rainbow as well, I think. Right, right. And Who there's the followed, Dio connection. Follow Dio, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very uh, intertwined and overlapping sort of family tree. And uh, Martin Birch is certainly right in the middle of it, or he would be the trunk with very deep roots. And uh, there's a reason that we're having a show about him today. Uh, he was only like 70 or 71 when he when he passed in, uh, it was late last year sometime. So uh, not not especially old, um, but he- August. Like, it was yeah, August. I think it was August of yeah. uh, 2021. years old, yeah. Yeah, and- uh, so he left us a, probably a little earlier than, you know, 
uh, 70, 71 is, is, is not a short life, but, uh, it does seem a little young, but, uh, he didn't leave without leaving a huge legacy that will live on forever and ever and ever. He was and fucking read, busy. He was fucking busy as shit. Or just say it. He was busy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if he did retire after that uh, Iron Maiden album, Fear of the Dark, <laughs> it was a well-deserved retirement because between, say, 68 and 69 until that album, he was just balls to the wall. One album yeah. a year it seemed like he was churning them out. Yeah, because I, I remember that. looking at that uh, that Blue Oyster Cult album, Fire of Unknown Origin. It came out in '81, and I know Number of the Beast came out in uh, 1982. So, I mean, that guy barely came up for air, and he was off to the next album. And and that next album was probably going to be another legendary heavy metal milestone. You know, if you were if you were to like I was saying a second ago, if you were to go in and just look at a uh, timeline, there's not there's not a series of maybe more than a handful of months where it looks like he took off from the mid seventies to the, you know, to the nineties. Yeah. He didn't take, he was, he was, he was working on someone's record every, literally every day, uh, for 20 years. Yeah. And it helped shape what the, the reason we're having a, sh we have a, a podcast, right? Right, exactly. I mean, the, in the uh, he warped everyone's brain, and they don't even know who to blame it on. You can blame it on partial, partial blame goes to Martin Birch in the most uh, heavenly aspect and respect. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, and uh, we will be mentioning him uh, from here to eternity. Even someday when this podcast is over, and you and I are just hanging out, we're going, "Oh yeah, you remember that album? Guess what? It was produced by Martin Birch." <laughs> yeah, that's going to be like a, a running joke now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or we'll be we'll hear a song on the radio. I mean, I don't listen to the radio, but just play right. along and and go, oh, "Oh my God, I recognize that tone." Or this reminds me of something, and it make you run to the liner notes, or look it up on your phone, or something just uh, that's relative. Yeah, and, uh, he packed a serious punch. Yeah, yeah. Well, God bless Martin Birch. He's responsible for uh, numerous of my all-time favorite albums, and uh, as well. Yeah, and I know the same is true for you and most people listening today. So. Uh, thank you, Martin. You will be missed, but we do appreciate the gifts you left behind. Today, my uh, shot of rock and roll to you, Jason, is what is your favorite Judas Priest deep cut? Impossible to answer. <laughs> there, um, there's so many moments uh, on... All of their records, you know, when you think of, um, I mean, the whole first record is a deep cut. Yeah. There's not really anything. Uh, your average Judas Priest fan doesn't sit around listening to Rock Rolla. I know there was a long time where that was, I was spinning Rock Rolla quite often. Yeah. Um, and some people have, you know, like bands that we like have covered songs off of rock Rolla, And I'm wondering if the listener even realized it was a Judas Priest cover, you know, a song. Um, I love, uh, never satisfied from rock Rolla. I like, uh, I like the, the, for lack of a better term, the piano ballads. Um, I like deceiver from uh uh sad wings i like uh the last rose of summer yeah sin after sin yeah uh i i'm gonna keep going i like uh before the dawn from yeah. Bent for leather yeah those yeah. are incredibly written uh some of those don't have drums they're full on ballads. There's no drums. Yeah. That yeah. was pre Beth. You know what I mean? And they're these <laughs> dark overtone. Beth is a, I love Beth. Beth is a great song, but it's yeah. a song about your girlfriend and your wife or 
you know, and these before the dawn are these sombering sadness, these uh, yeah. not blown out, but because they're very well put together and, uh, you know, he's not, he doesn't sound emo on it. Rob is, his singing is very tight. He's very, he's being, he's still operatic, but it, there's, there's not that um, that tight tinged, you know. As some people would say, you know, man, I like Rob when he does them high screams. You know what I mean? And it's not necessarily <laughs> about those high screams when he's singing. When he's singing uh, these uh, these balladeering uh, dark moments of basically, my heart is broken. Yeah, I miss he's, you. He's emoting. Correct. There is yeah. something uh, very tangible about the tone of the song that he's in all. And it, it's it's throughout the career of Judas Priest It's not necessarily one one moment uh, that uh, that goes beyond uh, what I'm talking about. Like, I don't I don't lose I don't lose. Uh, I, I remember those moments like like I can touch them. Yeah. You know, those yeah. songs mean something to me. Uh, you know, that really wasn't what your question was. Is uh, I mean, it answers a bunch of different things and more. Yeah. But it's not always the ballad that's a, that's a deep cut that I absolutely love by Judas Priest either. There's some crazy songs. Um, Dissident Aggressor is an early song as well that yeah. Slayer covered. Um, and I think that I, of course, love the Judas Priest version better than the Slayer version. Yeah. Although I just think that it's really freaking awesome that, that, uh, that Slayer was, um, basically, basically saying without Judas Priest, it would be no Slayer. Yeah. And I think that a lot of Slayer fans even admittingly probably don't hear the influence. I do. Yeah. I hear the influence uh, yeah. this priest has had on uh, on Slayer. Yeah, uh, mm, yeah. I think that that's that's uh, that's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> quite a few moments on Judas Priest records where I could I could lose my mind. I love burning up. Yeah, uh, from, yeah. Uh, from Hellbent for Leather. I'll uh, throw and, one and at the, you. I and and here you go. Side B, Solar Angels. Uh, you know, uh, point, of point of entry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Solar yeah. Angels, Desert Plains. Although those songs were they they actually did those live. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, still would be deep cuts. I mean, Judas Priest plays deep cuts live. Yeah. Yeah. I was th I was guessing that you might say uh, "Last Rose of Summer." I, I figured that that was going to be at least part of your answer, if not the uh, the definitive answer. <laughs> well, it 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 you know I don't know if uh, you know those guys sat around listening to hippie rock, or I'm sure they did. Yeah, Joni Mitchell or whatever you know, but Joan Baez. They could write songs that sounded like that stuff that, you know, obviously they, they really liked it. In Rob's book, he's, he says it's been said in interviews by like K.K. Downing that when they came over to court Rob for the vocal position in Judas Priest, that they heard him coming down the stairs singing a Doris Day song. <laughs> and, uh, I've and, heard that. Uh, and that's not true. Oh really? Just so you know, that's not true. Ah, yeah, Bob, okay. Bob says that's that's not true. <laughs> he said he was probably singing something, but it was not uh, a Doris Day song. I bet he so, wrote the book just to clear that up. <laughs> I think that he wrote the book for for uh, quite some bigger reasons than yeah, that. Yeah, I'm kidding. But of you know, he I'm needed kidding. to clean. He needed to clean, get that off his chest too. That by the way, it wasn't a Doris Day song. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> uh, I've got a shot of rock and roll for you. Shoot. This is probably an easy one. You know, uh, I'm going to try to get better at my shots of rock and roll. I promise. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't really think that there's a way for us to lose because we just know each other uh, pretty well uh, enough to throw this, this, these kinds of uh, sword fight 
you know, uh, if you will, uh, questions, but play, play catch kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. what is your best, maybe I should preface this. So, so you, uh, you're, you're familiar with, uh, picking up an envelope at will call and getting your tickets and getting your passes and actually getting to meet some of uh, the people that you've had the pleasure of interviewing in your sort of side gig of uh, rock and metal journalists for uh, public, you know, uh, public papers and uh, online sites as well, uh, publications that, that will help promote uh, shows coming to town right. here in uh, Central and South Texas. So I know who you have rubbed elbows with, and I'll just, I'll cut to the chase now. I had to set that up. What is your best Dio moment? Dio? <clears throat> um, I mean, was it on when you were on the phone with him or was it when you were drinking a beer with him? I'll tell you, uh, both, honestly, because both were an, a huge honor for me. Um, uh, I interviewed him over the phone when he was touring with Heaven and Hell, and uh, the interview was great. And the thing that was memorable was, um, at the time, uh, I was using some really primitive recording equipment. It was pretty pathetic. <laughs> you don't and, have to tell uh, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know you've heard dude. some of the tapes, yeah. yeah. But um it was one of these situations where and I forget the gear I was using. It was some low budget Radio Shack crapola something or other. But uh anyway, he calls to get on the phone and I'm making my introduction and he's making his and I walk too close to my recorder or something and this squall of feedback goes ripping through the phone, and I'm mortified. I'm just like, oh, my God, I just you know, sent feedback right through the ear of Ronnie James Dio. We haven't even started the interview. This is not a good start. And, embarrassing uh, moment by it was shoving, totally the, embarrassing. shoving the, the <laughs> recording microphone into the, the loudspeaker. That's what happened. Yeah. yeah that's well, how, well, that's well, how the, feedback happens. The kicker was I'm sitting there just mortified that this is how we're starting off. I've got the legendary Ronnie James Dio on the phone, and I just sent this squall of feedback through the line right into his ear. And I said, I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry about that. And he says, it's OK, Dave. I've heard feedback before. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear him calmly. I calmly thought that say, was like, awesome. Yeah, why, are you, was, why are you apologizing for my things that are uh, uh, a daily hazard? Uh, yeah, of my exactly. And the more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, of course he has. But I thought it was really gracious of him to make a, make a joke about it. And it was such a great moment that it was one of those things that I worked into the article you know, some you, you you interview these people knowing that you're you're trying to pull some answers out of them. You got a list of questions and you've got some things that you're hoping to to build an article out of. But there's oftentimes there's this little sidebar, some weird little quirky thing that happens in the course of speaking to them. And you go, oh, my God, I've got to include that because people will be interested in that, you know, because Every other magazine or newspaper or whatever you're going to read is going to have the quote about the new album and how great the tour is going. But how many of them are going to say, I just sent a squall of feedback into the ear of Ronnie James Dio and he made a joke about it. <laughs> yeah, that, that is awesome because he handled it like a gentleman. Yes. Laughing at, at the situation at yes. himself and you all together like let's have fun with that. Then, As opposed to, you know, when journalists write an article, the first thing they're not going to mention is how they like embarrass themselves through some feedback at the at the talent and yeah. uh, <laughs> piss them off before you even got to your first question and yeah. what they're going to do. And you can bag me up and you don't even, you don't even have to because, you know, I'm going to be correct is, you know, they're putting a bunch of big words and they're, they're using firecrackers to get the set the mood at the top of the the article. Yeah, and you're and you're putting like a a whoopee cushion, 
Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and Dio's in my on introduction. It. I'm making my introduction by way of embarrassing myself. Right. And, but <laughs> instead see, of being he, all instead of being ultra hip and cool. <laughs> yeah, and, and Dio's in on it. So yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. But I do want to follow up on your question because uh following the interview, uh Heaven and Hell came to San Antonio uh, within a few weeks after the interview. And uh, so I went to the gig. Um, his people were nice enough to leave me some passes to come back and say hello. In fact, he insisted on it at the end of the interview. He said, make sure you talk to the, whoever the publicist was, you know, setting up the, uh, the interview and make sure you come back and say hello. And I was like, you know, OK, well, sure, I'll, I'll take advantage of that if you're offering. So we went backstage, my wife and I, Kim, and um, and he was just awesome because there was a few people that were milling around back there that you could tell were just, you know, they were fans. They weren't road crew. They weren't band members. They weren't managers, whatever. And uh, he saw me standing there. Of course, he doesn't know what I look like. So I, I just, you know, sort of blurted out, hey, Ronnie. And he said, yeah. And I said, I'm Dave Glessner from the San Antonio Express News. I interviewed you a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, I'm the guy that sent the feedback through your ear. <laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. And he started laughing. He goes, come here, come on back. And we went back to uh, his it was larger than a dressing room. It was a hospitality room of some sort where he's got his own table and he's offering me beers and he sets me and Kim down at this table and just wants to talk. And there's like the security guy outside the door keeping everybody away. So we've got him all to ourselves. And he was just the, the most, you know, hospitable dude. You know, he wanted he was asking us all the questions at that point. Where do you live? What do you do for a living? How's your family? Where would you grow up? Uh, you want another beer? <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, he was he, awesome. Yeah, that's um, that's classic gentleman. Yeah, and how how he was raised and just uh, you're so lucky, and I'm sure that I I wanted to hear you tell that story. You're you're, I know you know that you're lucky that you got to be, uh, you know, with within his oxygen and yeah. and um, amazing, uh. You know, it's almost like he's not gone. You realize that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll carry that story with me forever. And I have to admit, I wasn't above taking a handful of records to have him sign, which he which he did. One of them, of course, being Heaven and Hell, uh, one of my top three all time favorite albums. So now I've got it autographed. Uh, courtesy of Ronnie James Dio. But unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh <laughs> It was embarrassing and funny and memorable and, uh, you know, great story. Uh, and I'll, I'll cherish that memory forever. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, absolutely. I that would be a doozy. <laughs> it uh, was a doozy. It was yeah. indeed a doozy. All right, Jason. Uh, good let's, episode. Uh, let's plan on doing this again real soon. Uh, yeah. we'll wrap it up for this go around, uh, metal Dave here on behalf of Jason McMaster. Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, and we will talk to you again real soon. 